How many of you, or how many, well, how, how would you like to be considered the most environmentally friendly, or how would you like to be your producers to be considered the most environmentally friendly producers, farmers in the world? Okay, maybe I should have asked that differently. How many of you would not like that? We got one that would not like that. I think we all would like to be considered that. I'm not stopping there, though. In addition to that, how would you like to be considered one that's really making a difference in feeding the world? Okay, there you go. I think I've got a few more hands coming up. I think we want both, don't we? Um, those are our two big challenges, I think, especially, well, it's all over. It used to be just the Chesapeake Bay area, the environmental thing, but they told us right up front we were a test case for the Mississippi River Valley, and they're, they're scrambling now with the environmental issues. But I think there are things that we can do, and that's why I, I really like, and this is a quote that, this is over 100 years old, someone that really had some foresight into things and said agriculture will come into its own when fields are green in the winter. Now this gentleman was from Georgia and their fields are just starting to be green in the winter and they do a lot of tillage in that area. But this quote's also used a lot to emphasize the advantage of double of cover crops. First of all, I don't want to say anything. First of all, here's a disclaimer. I am not against cover crops. Not at all. They're one of our best tools for building our soil, increasing our yield, feeding the world in a secondary sense. But the best cover crop that I know of is one that we can also take 70, 80, 90, 120 bushels of grain off. Because in order, how, how much do we need to increase food production by 2050? What are some numbers that you've heard? You've probably heard them at this meeting. 50%, 70%, 100%. And I just came back from my third trip to China. I started, I think the first trip was about six years ago. And each trip, I've eaten more meat while in China. They are eating much more meat than they ever have. And there's a lot of Chinamen, China women. Believe it or not, I mean, it's in the country, it's crowded over there. Once you get a taste of chicken and pork in your mouth, you don't go back tofu. <laughs> I don't think they're going to revert back just because they built all the buildings they need to build now and their steel industry you know, they're not requiring as much steel. Once you get a good taste in your mouth, you generally don't go back eating something. I don't, I don't think we can increase food production in the way they're talking about by getting more bushels per acre. We can't increase really, we can't produce enough feed for these animals by getting, by doubling that's what we would take. We're not going to double yields per acre. There's also no, not a lot more good land. There's some real potential in Africa and in Asia for increasing yields uh, per acre. But generally, there's not any more land. Maybe a few more acres in Brazil. But it's not going to meet the demand. One thing we can do, though, is we can grow two crops in one year. And, and see, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm ranting a little bit. And because I'm passionate about this subject, I've worked on this double crop system for, well, as long as I've been here, 20 years. And, of course, we worked on it in other aspects and before that. But I really think this is the best way we can solve a couple of different problems. It's environmentally sound. We can help feed the world. We've got if production efficiency gains are really tremendous. If we start looking into that. The other thing most people don't realize, we can have higher quality grain if we do this right from a wheat standpoint, 
If you want good high protein soybean, you double crop them. Protein's going to be higher, the seed quality is higher, everything about the actual bean itself is better in double crop. There's a number of reasons for that I won't go into. The other thing, and most important, I think there's greater income for all. With wheat prices the way they are, you may say that's not true, but on, in general there's greater income. It's got to be. We've got two crops growing in the same year. So there's greater income, and that's going to trickle down to the suppliers. We're going to sell more equipment. We're going to sell more chemical. We're going to sell more fertilizer. So in general, this is a good system for everyone. It stimulates the economy. That's where we need to be going. The problem, though, as I've already mentioned, I hope I didn't blind you by shining that laser in your eye. I hit the wrong button. He just took a laser right now at short distance. This dollar sign's been shrinking because of wheat and because of beans. Yeah, but let's face it, guys, we weren't going to, 15 to $18 beans were not going to last. Neither was six to $7 corn. That's an abnormality. Maybe it'll happen again in the future, but wheat's really tough. That's the problem, and that's what we need to solve right now, and that's what I want to talk to you about. If you only take home a few messages, this is one I want you to take home. Do not treat this double crop soybean the same way you'd treat a full season. You must treat them as two separate crops. They're very different. I'm going to go into the main reason behind that. There are others, but the main reason behind we cannot treat double crop like full season. Worse yet, and you get farther west of here, say Illinois, Indiana, where they are double cropping, they're treating the double crop beans like a cover crop. And if they harvest something off of it, good. I won't say everybody's doing that. Many are not, but generally we are the best double crop wheat soybean growers in the world. I think people from other states are realizing that and they're coming to us for information. But we've got to treat both crops differently. High yielding wheat crop, intensively managed soybean crop. I would say we have to intensively manage this more than we do this one. This one's much more forgiving. Just like a soybean crop, I'll say Nebraska because I've lived there. That's a forgiving crop. Wow, black soil, 50 foot deep. You, 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 can do, you can really screw things up on, on situations like that. Same, similar about full season beans. You can screw up a lot of things full season beans you can't on double crop. This is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the problem. And then I'm going to go through some steps to maximize and protect our yields. And then I will talk briefly about a project, a multi-state project that we've got going on. I'm going to go back 20 years when I first started Virginia Tech. Jim Dunphy at NC State, soybean specialist there, showed me this graph. We had a planting date discussion. It wasn't a double crop discussion. It was a planting date discussion. He said, David, this explains everything about planting date, or at least 80% of, of it. I said, okay, tell me about it. Show me the graph. This is yield. No, not 100 bushel, 100% 100 of maximum yield. This is planting date. This is how our yield goes along, falls off all of a sudden. Okay? Jim says, if I can get my soybeans, and most of his soybeans were in wide rows. Most of those were actually 36-inch rows because the mule's butt in North Carolina is bigger than the mule's butt in Del Mar. We're in 30-inch rows. You get down to Texas, it's 40-inch rows. They got some big mules in Texas. So anyway, most of this is in 36-inch rows. He said, if I can lap the middle by flowering, but he does. He did have some drilled beans and other other row spacing and all this data he, he accumulated. Jim's actually been there over 40 years. He's older than I am, I guess. Um, he said, if I can lap the middles and get them three feet tall. I will not get a yield loss, or I will not get much yield loss, but if I can't lap the middles and they don't grow tall enough, this yield rapidly drops off. 
I followed up on that for the next five years, maybe ten. I don't know. I've been working on this for a long time. But I really, the next five years after that, 15 years ago, we completed our work. I said it's not tall and lapped. We found out we don't need them 36 inches tall. I need a leaf area index of three and a half to four. And that's a range, but let's just say four. I need four layers of leaves per out there in the field. I need four acres of leaves per acre of ground. I need four square feet of leaves per acre of ground if I measured all those leaves. And we had some new tools that we could rapidly do that, rapidly versus the old way we did it. And that's what we came up to. Another thing, it didn't have to be at flower, and it needed to be right when those first seed, first uh, pods started forming at the top of the plant. Indeterminate plant, you need to look at the top, determine it, they bloom all at once, you up and down the stalk on the determinate. So R3 stage, we got little pods. If I didn't make that leaf area index of four, the yield rapidly drops off. It's really interesting because the, the graph looked just the same almost from what Jim developed and I developed, but I, I narrowed this down. It's really number of leaves. It does, it's not height or actually lapping. Going a little further on this. How many of you heard uh, Sean's talk on soybean? Um, uh, not Conley. Sean's last name. Steel, Castile. There's a lot of Sean soybean people in the world today. Sean Connolly's in Wisconsin, Castile's in Indiana. He's 100% correct in everything he said, and I really enjoyed his talk. The only difference is he's up in this part of the curve. Remember he says that yield was dropping off like this? We're still getting about a 10% yield loss, even if I can't form the amount of, even if I can form enough leaf area, we're still getting this drop. What did he say? Why was the reason for that? Long story short. First of all, he almost assumed that we had enough leaf area out there. He went into that a little bit, but not much. He's because he's pushing that reproductive stages into shorter days. There's less light being captured. There's less growing degree days. So it's growing degree days and light capture. He was almost assuming narrow rows, he was building that leaf area. So really he's up here and he's 100% correct. We still see that. Just because when we plant late, we're pushing that critical time later in the year, days are shorter, there's less heat units, that type of thing. But he really showed some of this, but not that drastic. Not only are we looking at shorter days, less total sunlight, we're intercepting less of that sunlight, and that's what's kicking us. And that's where I want to spend most of my time. We've got to get this up. There are some other little things we can do that help our double crop yields, but 80% of it's right here. What's the problem with this graph? What is the big problem with this graph? And this is a problem I have not been able to solve for 20 years. Does anybody see it? I got a scale here, right? Where's my scale? Sometimes this date right here is the middle of May. Rarely middle of May in Virginia or North Carolina. It could be the middle of May in Pennsylvania. Sometimes it's July 15th. So the reason I make this graph look so pretty is I don't include the details. I'll show you some of the details. I'll just show you one location, two different years, and show you what happens. The reason I don't have a date here is this is a study six years ago in southeast Virginia, Suffolk, Virginia. This is a poorly drained soil with tile four inches down. I've rarely yielded less than 50 bushels of soybean on this soil. Okay, high yielding soil. I did this year though, didn't I? I was down to 40 bushel. Still not bad for a really dry year for us in southeast Virginia. The details you don't need to look at. We fallowed the ground. We planted rye, barley, or wheat. Long story short, that did not make a lot of difference. If the barley or wheat was mature, we harvested it for grain, treated it as a true double crop setting. If it was not mature, we treated it as a cover crop. But that didn't matter. When did the yield start dropping off that year? Late May. That rapid drop-off was late May. 
and it leveled off, but don't worry about this. Really, this curve looks more like this. Let's go to a same year, dry year, another soil. Deep sand. This is a Nassman sandy, loamy fine sand. They're being generous, calling it a loamy fine sand. It's pretty much a sand. If I get rain every week, I can produce 50 plus bushel, but it's generally not very good. It didn't matter, did it, when I planted. We actually caught rain at the end of the year that helped these late plantings. This is planting date, by the way. This is planting date, different dates. We had nine different planting dates. Same thing with this previous study. Had nine different planting dates and tracked the response of planting date on yield in double crop settings. Let's go to a year later, much better year. I'm going back to this good soil. We're up there, well, I'll say an average year. It's not a great year, but an average year for this soil. When did my yield drop off? Kind of the normal time we expect, right when we're ready to plant wheat. Most of my data is in this. I would say 50% of the data I have, and I've got dozens of studies like this on farm as well as uh, small plot. This is normal. The other 25% would be, on each side of that, would be different. That's the reason I cannot, I mean, on average, we get a half a bushel decrease in soybean yield per day delay in planting after about mid-June. And that's kind of what I say in the guide. And that's what a lot of people say. Realistically, though, we're getting a half a bushel right here loss per day delay in planting. Down here, we're closer to a bushel per acre loss per day. Up here, we're just a fraction of a bushel per day. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? Because this is the key. The idea is we've got to have this leaf area, not necessarily lapped or tall enough, but we've got to have this leaf area to get up to this. This is our goal. Let's keep yields up here, even if we plant late. That's the goal. How do we do that? Well, 80% and I, I think that's realistic. 80%, the double crop yields planting date is 80% of the problem. So, if this is the big problem, what can we do to alter this? That's what we need to think about. What can we do to alter this? There's about 20% other things we can do to bump our yield, various things, inputs and those things. But we've got to form the leaf area to capture the light to produce the yield. If we don't get to that level, I don't even want to talk about late season fertilizer or anything like that because it will be a waste of product. We've got to get those leaves first. We've got to get it on that left side of that curve. I want this, not this. Believe it or not, this is the same field. Both of these crops were flowering. Which one's going to yield more? Well, that's, yeah, this one yielded 40, 50 bushel. This is nearly 15 years ago, and this yielded 20. Same field. Actually, it's, uh, I'll show you this field shortly. But I'll show you the field, how different it is. But I want this. So, I told you to remember one thing. I said, make sure you remember that we can't manage double crop like we do full season. Next thing is remember we need to put, first of all, position the soybean for a longer season. That's the real problem. We don't have a long enough season. Second of all, grow more leaves. And then thirdly, plant those leaves. Now, if you remember that, I'm not giving you details there. I'm going to go into, I'm going to spend most of the rest of my time on positioning that crop for a longer season, which basically means an early planting date. There are some things we can do. We've been doing quite a bit of research on that recently, and we're seeing some very good results. Number one, one thing we can do, especially when wheat price is so out of whack with soybean, we need to consider early maturing wheat varieties. Now that's too late for this year, but think about it in the future. Now, in the future, it looks like at least the future prices of wheat, which I don't, I'm sure we're going to get a better price for wheat a year from now than we are now because there's not very many acres going in. Uh, 
So it'll come back into range, but on a kind of average, this is kind of my rule of thumb. I can sacrifice one bushel of wheat if I can plant one day earlier. So if I can plant five days earlier, you know, I'm gaining enough money to pay for any yield loss on the wheat. Right now, this is a lot closer to one and a half bushel equals a half a bushel of beans. So, we got to look at the system. We just can't look at, you know, 100 bushel wheat because we're using a later maturing variety and maybe we need to consider early maturing variety. The other thing that I'm not recommending yet is uh, plant early maturing variety. We can plant that early. We have started more detailed research with our wheat breeder, Carl Griffin. I think that's Carl right there. Many of you know him. He's developed. I might not be wrong if I say he's developed most of the varieties for this area that we're growing now. Either the company selling or, or their public variety. We're actually just conducting some studies looking at early maturing varieties, mid maturing varieties, and late maturing varieties. The late ones generally yield better. Three different planting dates. We're starting to plant in mid September. Then we're planting in early October, and then we're planting in mid to late October. Looking at multiple varieties, I think we have 16. Some of these are breeding lines that he's testing, others are varieties we have now. The data's still out there. We definitely, the problem with this is we start planting early, what happens? Wheat, if we plant wheat early, what happens? Frost, spring frost going really nailless. Carl thinks he's got some varieties we can avoid that. They're photoperiod sensitive, so it won't automatically head out early. And we saw some of that this year. But long story, just looking at the varieties we have now, you definitely don't want to plant an early maturing variety early until we get these newer varieties out here. If we can get an early maturing variety that will yield decently and plant that early, we can probably gain 10 days in the soybean plant. Yes? Uh, traditionally, the planting date is driven at least here by Hessian, Hessian fly right. date. Okay. That's the mythical Hessian Yeah. Okay. That Hessian fly was the question. That planting date's driven by... Mythical Hessian fly, is that what I heard? Um, we're using seed treatments, and we're hoping that's going to solve the issue with this. There may be an added cost to this, or we can do that. And you get down to North Carolina, that is a real problem. Southeast Virginia, it can occasionally be a real problem. So we are aware of that. We actually didn't see any problem with treated seed last year. Does that solve the problem? I'm not the expert in that. Um, so there are some other issues. The big issue is this frost thing. Let's solve that first. If we can come up with a variety, maybe we can do something. But I, I'm not going to show you any data because we really only have one year of data at multiple locations, but it really was, the environment really, um, I, I, the data looks real weird right now. But I think the early maturing varieties, we definitely don't want to plant them mid-September. Mid mid but we did have some late maturing varieties planted in September that looked like to be with some of our highest yielding ones. And then you talk about mid-maturing varieties, maybe planting the 1st of October, you know, barley planting time for us, or you know, that first couple of weeks in October. Hey, they didn't look so bad. They didn't get frozen. Not all of them. Some of them got nailed that are, you know, with frost. But, you know, it's something we can work on, future thing. But that's one thing we can do. If we can gain 5 to 10 days, we've done a lot of good even if the yields are slightly lower. I mean, what's the average harvest moisture for wheat for you? 13%? 18, good, good. Who's taking it? You're drying them. Okay, so that's the key. If we start talking about higher, you know, harvesting 18 to 20% moisture, there's a real cost in that, right? I'm going to show you some data where we've just collected two years from that may justify that cost. But you've got to dry it down quick. You know, after you stick your hand in some 18% moisture wheat an hour or two after you harvest it, it's heating up. Uh, you've got to get it moved quick. There are buyers around in the Mid-Atlantic area that will not dock you for 20% or less if you take it right to them. Why? I'll show you some data that proves this, but the grain quality is so much better. They want food-grade wheat. They don't, they're not dealing in feed-grade wheat. 
They want food grade wheat. But I, I don't know of anybody else that might be doing that. Small area, that's an issue. So there's a cost to that. You either got to dry it yourself or you're going to take a dot, you're going to get docked for that because somebody's got to dry it. But let's look at some results from that. This is a multi-state study, part of our Mid-Atlantic Double Crop Initiative. We have five states here. I've got two years of data. This is relative yield. We had to do that because the yield was different in every state. So this is relative yield, 100%. This is days after our first harvest. We attempted to start harvesting around 18 to 20% moisture. Then we harvested every four to seven days afterwards. We tried four days. Sometimes rain would mess us up. This is our wheat yield. There's not a lot of yield loss. It looks much like the soybean yield loss curve I showed you. Not much yield loss early, but you know, after 10 days, which is here is our normal, I would say on average, this is our normal wheat harvesting time, 13% moisture time. We start losing a lot of yield. That's when, if you want to start here, looks like we're immediately losing yields. We have nine site locations for this. That's a pretty strong data set. Why did this occur? Why are we getting yield loss? Why? One reason is test weight. That doesn't account for all of it. But there's your test weight. It immediately fell. Grain quality, we're going to get to that too, whoever said that over there. Test weight immediately fell, but you got a lot of harvest losses right up there in the header and so forth. You're shattering so forth. You let wait until 13% moisture. You're literally getting more of the grain in. It's just like corn. You're pulling more of the grain in the combine. So this is, you know, test weight's a big part of it. It doesn't answer the whole story. Quality, what does it do to quality? Anybody heard of falling number? You don't want a falling number less than 300. I don't have time to go into what that is, but that is our main quality number. We are evaluating multiple quality factors in this, milling quality, the dose strength, and that type of thing. Um, but this was the big one. Look at falling number. Uh, it held up pretty good until that normal harvest date, and then it just starts rapidly falling. This is the reason one buyer I know takes this high moisture of wheat. They take it from a small area, they'll dry it down, don't charge you much dockage for it. How many areas can we do this profitably? I don't know, but at least we're going to collect the data to do some economics on this and see if we can convince buyers to heart, you know, well, you know, other buyers start taking it 15% this year. Matter of fact, we were conducting the test. I was actually handling the test in North Carolina. When we were out there, the grower cut around. He said, no, it's too wet. Later that afternoon, he got moved into an earlier maturing variety. It's still too wet. And then he had a call, called Purdue, and he said, they're taking it. 15%, so he was taking 16% moisture grain there. Did pretty well. But we need to convince the buyers that there's a really advantage to this. Another thing, we've got to consider the soybean response. This is, I actually put dates on here, not day after harvest, but here are the dates. There's your yield loss due to delayed harvest. This is only five, four states. North Carolina was involved in 15. Uh, the data's coming in right now. I'm not, I don't have that data summarized this year, but I don't doubt it's not going to look much different than that. Look at the type of yield loss we have. We did not measure leaf area index, but we did measure NDVI or the normalized difference vegetative index. We used a green seeker. It's the same thing you're using for fertilizer applications in corn. It's a good relationship with leaf area index. I've got other data to show that, but what we found to get that LAI of four, I do need around 0.85 or 0.9 reading on that active sensor, that green seeker. So, most of the cases, we never maxed our leaf fair. These were all dry land studies. I think unless Corey or had one under irrigation, but I think they were all dry land. That's the reason for this. Again, it's all there. It's a strong data set. I imagine the data set will get stronger this year. So, 
you know, we're trying to build a data set. The next step would be to go to the buyers or go to the farmers and say, you know, drying facilities may or may not pay for themselves. We've got to run all the economics through this using both crops and see if that will pay or at least get the buyers to say, hey, you know, we've got some good quality grain here and look, at, and you'll also get more soybean out of this. If we can bump up the bushels per acre of soybean by two bushel, think about how many more soybeans those same buyers will be buying. Choose a later maturing soybean variety. That is something we can do on average to help our yields in double crop soybean. It's the same point we're positioning that soybean for a longer growing season, even if we you know, plant early, but if you can't plant early, choose a late maturing variety. It's the same point. I want this and not this. I also say less productive soil later, maturing variety will do better. Remember I told you these two pictures were from the same field. There's the field. You can't really see it, but you see this, this is coming from actually this area. This is coming from this little strip through here. This is a big study we had at the time, but I, I took all this data from over here. You know, later maturing variety did a lot better here. Didn't really matter too much here. Why? Because later maturing varieties there are longer, it builds more leaf area, it captures more light, it produces more yield. Is that always the case? What do you think? How many of your growers are irrigating? If we can irrigate and, oops, if we can irrigate and get our beans to look like this at flowering or early pod development, with an early maturing variety, then maybe it's okay. All right, I'll show you some data that shows that. I'm gonna go to the Southern Piedmont of Virginia. This is what I call a yellow and orange clay. I was raised on this type of soil in North Carolina. Before I left to go to graduate school, I planted the whole farm to pine trees because the only thing I could grow profitably on it was hay. Of course, we were tilling everything then. I could probably profitably grow soybean on it now, but very unproductive soil. This is my variety test data. I tested between 150, 200 varieties a year. This is 10 years worth of data. Each point represents one year, the average of all those varieties. Now, the variability will be 10 bushel on each side of this between the lowest and high yielding variety. But this is the average for that year. Average for that year, there should be 10 points right there. If there's not 10, we've got some overlap. Early fours, which for us in this part of the world would be extremely early. That'd be more like a two or three in some of the northern areas. This is that late four. This area is really more adapted to fives. I've grouped all the fives together, but a late four. This may be the equivalent to a late three, early four, late four, you know, in the eastern shore, but farther north it could be equivalent to even earlier maturing varieties. But the point remains, on average, that's what I just said, right? Even at low yield potentials, we still get the later maturing variety doing better, solely because of leaf area. What happened here? Those are pretty darn good double crop yields, aren't they? I like those. We can do it. I've done it several times. Actually, I think we've got some hidden data here. This looks very similar. You know, we've got these high yield potentials. What's going on there? I did not irrigate. I just got a lot of rainfall. It built up the leaf area early, and it didn't matter if I had a late maturing variety. I'm going to relate that back to irrigation. I've seen irrigated fields that I'm working with now here on the eastern shore that leaf area is not a big problem. If they irrigate early enough and build the leaf area, don't wait until flower to irrigate. Let's go to another study. Let's come to the eastern shore. I'll show you this data. Double crop variety test in Painter. A southern, e southern eastern shore. Late fours, uh, early fours, late fours, late fives. The trend remains the same. You know, average, low yield potentials, late maturing varieties do better. I've actually got two sets of data, and I went in and dug into this. These are actually sitting on top of each other. We had two years there that we had this trend. The early four looked really good. Now look at the yield potential. I have yielded close to 100 bushel beans in small plots on double crop. 
Now, those beans didn't look like double crop. They were big. We had leaf area indexes of five. Unusual. This is dry land again, but had a couple of good years. And this is a better soil. It's sandy, sandy loam, but we've got a good sandy clay layer underneath it. One of our better yielding soils that we conduct a variety test on. So, yeah, later maturing variety, that is important, but there are some caveats there. I like a stripper header that just removes the grain. From our standpoint in this discussion, it's because you can move through that field really quick. I'm, I'm, I, under a large acreage, you can save yourself many days harvesting. Caveat here, though, is keep in mind you've eventually got to run this straw through a combine. Okay? You eventually need to run this through a combine. If you're more pushed for time in November and December, then this isn't your tool. In southeast Virginia, northeast North Carolina, we had a lot of these bought. I think people only owned them for one, maybe two years. Why do you, th why do you think that happened? Well, straw is worth money. That, that's not the reason. Okay, that's a good point. The straw could be worth money. So we, that even delays planting heart further. But the reason they went, you know, Virginia, we really don't get the brunt of the hurricanes, do we? North Carolina kind of sticks out. Southern, Southeast Virginia, we tend to get hurricanes. You don't want to get caught in a hurricane situation and the fields be too wet. They want to get that crop out real early. Most of the growers with stripper headers said, I cannot, appeal, I cannot afford to slow down at soybean harvest because it may, if I don't get them harvested early, I may be out there in February or March, and that's never good. So that's the reason they didn't like the stripper header, but it makes it much easier to plant into. I love following a stripper header to plant beans. If nothing's on the ground, it's easy to plant into. But there's some real advantage and it speeds up that wheat harvest. You can probably plant your beans. All this needs to go into the calculations of whether or not it's worthwhile. Then plant soybean immediately after wheat planting. I really think I've got most of our growers in Virginia doing this. I rarely see a wheat field that's being harvested that the, the planter is not in there. Uh, well, I won't say rarely, but I see it's not uncommon to see both going on in the same field. Yes. to avoid okay the question has to do with pod worms or we call them corn ear worms same thing um, I'm gonna talk about that a little later because that becomes more important um, earlier planting is gonna help with that actually but we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little later um, anyway plant the beans as soon as you can long story short and make sure you put them at the right depth in the soil moisture. I don't like put it, planting beans in dry soils, even though it'll work. Beans will sit there a long time in completely dry soil, but rarely do I see a complete entire field dry. And I don't mind the wet areas or the dry areas. I don't like that in between because then they germinate, swell, sometimes emerge and then die due to lack of water. So I don't mind planting them deep in double crop. They'll come up a little deeper. Uh, but let's. And again, I've spent most of my time on this. Let's talk a little bit more about growing more leaves. There's a few techniques we can use that I won't go into detail. One thing I will want to discuss is, is fertilizer. You talked about removing straw. Remember, it's 25 pounds of potassium. I think there's more in there. Uh, Mark Ryder still hadn't given me the data, but we've collected a lot of this data in the last few years on the amount of potassium in wheat straw. I think there's more than this. It's easy to get two tons of straw, and I think in the higher yielding wheat, we can get three tons of straw. If you're taking this off, make sure they're paying you what it's worth, first of all. And the soil quality issue, that's another issue by not leaving it, but it will slow down your harvest, of course, unless you can get somebody out there or you're really good at it. There's an extra operation there. Fertilize for both crops. After three years of work with potassium, I don't know much about phosphorus. We haven't done that work, but potassium, I was wondering, do we need to split that application? After looking at our double crop data three years of that, I don't think we do. 
largely because if we leave the, if we leave the straw, but even if we don't leave the straw, much of that potassium that had leached down into the soil is brought back up to the top. So I don't see a big issue with potassium if we're if I think we can still fertilize everything in front of the wheat crop. I don't think we're going to gain much by fertile, splitting that application just by looking at the potassium data. Oh, by the way, off the subject, our studies in potassium, which is one of the few that's ever been conducted on sandy soils and Piedmont soils, we had about half split. Long story short, low CEC soils, don't believe the Arkansas data and the Iowa data. It behaves very differently around here. Potassium leaches because there's nothing to hold it. We need more potassium if it's testing low than we're re currently recommending. We need less, to fit less if it's testing medium and high. Holds true for looks like both double crop and full season, but the full the double crop with this straw gives you a whole different number to put into the equation. Irrigate if you got it and do it early. Don't follow full season recommendations that say you really don't need any water until it starts flowering. We need to fill that profile up as soon as we can because I want to keep those roots growing down. Roots won't grow into dry soil under an average year or a dry year. That wheat crop's going to remove everything from that profile and you're basically farming the top of that soil until we fill it up. We've got to fill it up. Get those roots down. That's going to help us later. It'll also grow these leaf area, this leaf. This is a double crop field right at flowering. I saw very little. Yeah, I don't, of course, what what Sean say about green by the 4th of July? Uh, green, does anybody remember that? It's a good saying. Green by eye by the 4th of July. Well, we don't have that option. I've got to figure out something green by the 1st of August or something like that, but I can't rhyme it with that. But good point. There's something we can do with variety selection outside of maturity group, narrow rows, high seed and rate, uniform planting. We can talk more about these and how they vary depending on the planting date. Narrow rows increase leaf area. I want this, not this. I don't like a drill because of this. That hurts us as much as population. I'd much rather see a 15 inch planter than a control spill drill. This drill is actually one that, well, I dug out our old drill because I tore our barn down at my mother's house. We've got a drill. It's got to be 70 years old. Same technology. There's a rope on it that you pull to drop the things down. That's how old it was. Same technology. This drill is actually one that we metered to seed. And I can show you this data. Uh, you can go back and look at it later in detail. But long story short, we had four years of data. We compared these three. We compared the Ken Kenzie Planner to a controlled spill drill and also to this drill that metered the seed. This drill had other problems. I'm not recommending it, but it did a nice job of metering the seed out. Long story short, three out of four years, the control spill drill yielded the same as the 15-inch planter, even, even though theoretically by narrowing the rows, we, this is all double crop data, we should have gained some yield by narrowing that row from 15 to 7.5, but I couldn't do it. That fourth year, the 15 inch planter out yielded the drill. Now, two out of the three years, when I compared this 7.5 inch drill that metered the seed to the Kinsey planter that metered the seed, two out of those three years, I saw that extra yield bump. About a 10% yield bump is pretty significant due to leaf area. The third year, they yielded the same. That third year, we had good growth. Didn't need that extra narrow row space and all dry land. I'll get back into soil fertility, everybody wants to put nitrogen on uh, double crop beans. I did a couple of years of study, multiple locations in which we, I think it was seven or eight locations, we banded nitrogen right between 15 inch rows. I hope that we were not going to get a yield response so I wouldn't have to change my recommendation. My recommendation did not change because we did consistently get a one bushel yield response at about 25 pounds. But that's a wash. It doesn't pay for the nitrogen. But it's there why we measured NDVI, and that was the reason we got a little bit more growth. The point is, anything we can do to stimulate this growth is going to help. 
and we need to protect that leaf area. I'm not going to have time to really go into your question on corn earworm, but one thing we got to consider are these tram lines. This will go a long ways. We're losing in double crop soybeans between 2 and 4% of our yield, depending on the width of the sprayer. 120 foot sprayer, maybe we're only using, losing 2%. Compare that to full season. And this was data out of Delaware and Virginia. Compared to full season, we're losing 1 to 2%. We're almost doubling the yield loss by running over beans, double crop beans, than we are full season beans. If we're going to take double crop beans to the next highest level, we need to use tram lines again. Kind of got away from it with guidance systems, but that's not the reason to use tram lines. If we do this right, I don't, I don't want you to see those tram lines. We're going to fill them up. Weeds are going to cause more problem in double crop because they're competing with them. We need to spray our weeds at least three weeks after planting to, to prevent a yield loss. That's been shown, documented. It will also help prevent resistance, which is a bigger problem. Double crop, I think we're getting that close to uh, two weeks. May have to spray twice. Defoliators, pod fillers. Okay, real quick, we're, I think it's a bigger problem in double crop because it's later in the season. we got more, more critters out there. They're going to be farther along, eating more. They're bigger to eat more, uh, and that's what we see with that. Defoliators, we can tolerate 20% defoliation, right? Yeah, if I got a full season plant with a leaf area index of six, if I'm down around four, I can't tolerate it. We need to be more vigilant with defoliators. And I'll argue with the entomologists about that, still arguing with them, but it, it happens. Foliar diseases, long story short, I can't predict yet if fungicides will pay because our fungicides are preventative. We put them on before the disease comes in. We're getting closer. We've, we're looking at some models to do that with weather models. But one thing we have found, if I can get the leaf area up where we need it, I'm seeing more disease in double crop. Same reason as insects, just because we've already had a full season crop to produce a lot of inoculum. I really do think we're getting, and now we get a response in Virginia on about one third of the time to a fungicide, which ain't bad. Double crop, I think, is approaching 50% of the time. If we can get the canopy, if we've got a short canopy, don't worry about it. You've got enough wind movement through there, no disease will survive. Nematodes, double crop will help with nematode problems because you give them an extra two, three, four weeks in which nothing's growing. Nothing's growing. There's nothing to live off of. They die down. But with that said, if you've got a field of nematode problems, it's worse than double crop. One last thing I want you to recognize. I know I'm running over my time period, but I want to say this anyway. We do have a mid-Atlantic double cropping initiative. These are the original people that pulled this together. This team's growing. We're being funded. We're being funded by the United Soybean Board on this. We had several objectives. One is to pull all the information together on double crop into one location. I had a postdoctoral associate to do this. Long story short, there's not a lot of double crop research out there. There's a lot of planting date research, but it don't match up with double crop planting date research. We need more. We're doing an on-farm, multi-state on-farm program. Here are the trials we put out last year and the states we put them out last year as a trial. We want to expand this. If anybody's interested in this, we want to do these over all the states. I'd like to see each of these trials in all five states. It gives us an idea of how the environment is affecting it. This is our research objective. Oh, let's see. This is our research objective that I showed you the data on, planting early, 20% moisture wheat, and then we've got individual state projects. The only problem with this is United Soybean Board cut our funding from last year. Long story short, they didn't have as much money, had a lot of projects to fund. They changed their strategic plan, but after looking at their evaluation sheets and the way they ranked projects, what it boiled down to is most of the soybean growers in this country, which are in Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, consider double crop high risk, low return. 
I don't think we consider it that here, but it makes sense to them. You push double crop too far north, you're going to get less soybean yield, and it's going to probably be more expensive. So that's long story short. We're, we're going to state boards. We're going to keep the project going because I think we're getting good data out of it. But we, we are looking for additional funding. I think we're going to keep this rolling. Position your crop for a long season. Grow more leaves. And then protect that leaf area. Thank you.